Okay, it's a little bit after six, so we'll get started. Um, and thank you to everybody uh, for attending. Uh, this is the third series of the Wound Healing Chronicles of Wound Scene Investigation webinars, um, a series that is provided free of charge by the Wound Healing Society um, to all attendees. And please note, if you have any questions throughout this evening's presentation on skin tears, utilize the Q&A box and we'll address as many questions as possible at the end of the webinar. And as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. So um, I'm Kath Bogie. I'm a biomedical engineer and professor at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland and chair of the Education Committee. And I'll pass over to Lisa to introduce herself. Hello, I'm Lisa Castor. I'm a wound care nurse practitioner in hospital-based clinic in central Indiana. Mohammed. So I'm Mohammed Al Masri, a plastic surgeon scientist and assistant professor at Department of Surgery, uh, University of Pittsburgh. And I will be uh, presenting the first part of today's session, and Laura will be presenting the second part. Uh, Laura, you can introduce yourself, and then I can. Hi, I'm Laura Sabota. I'm a family nurse practitioner, wound specialist in the Milwaukee metro area. Back to you, Mohammed. Thank you. I will just share my screen now. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So we'll start today's topic with a little bit background about the skin tears. Uh, uh, some definition, some histological aspects of the process and the pathological background about the disease itself. And then we will move forward in the second part of the webinar uh, to Laura to uh, spot the light for uh, some cases, clinical cases and examples. And then we'll have like some discussion at the end of the webinar. Uh, and feel free during the discussion to send the questions or like raise your hands if you have any. Uh, so what are the skin tears? Uh, by definition, uh, according to uh, most of the literature and the consensus by the international uh, advisory panel is a traumatic wound caused by mechanical forces, including removal of adhesives. And severity may vary by depth, but shouldn't extend through the subcutaneous layer. And most of the times will be confusing with the uh, laceration and the cutaneous laceration. And common causes of this skin tears can, uh, like, you know, from normal daily activities, like falls, uh, adhesive removals, or which will result in to shearing and the friction uh, or plant trauma that causes separation of, of the skin layers. Uh, and the subsequent wounds are partial or full thickness, depending upon the degree of the tissue damage. And regardless of the definition, skin tears commonly occur in, uh, uh, in the older ages and uh, immunocompromised patients and the individuals requiring assistance uh, with personal care. The International Skin Tear Advisory Panel uh, classified the skin tears into three uh, types. Uh, the first type, which has no skin loss, with no skin loss. It is just in the first picture, you can see linear or flap tear, which can be repositioned to cover the wound. But in the type two, there is partial flap loss and the flap cannot be repositioned uh, to cover the wound. Uh, the third category, uh, it is the whole loss of the, uh, of the flap uh, and the entire wound bed is exposed. Uh, we'll move forward to uh, uh, spot the light on the causes. What are the causes of fragile skin? Uh, most important uh, or the, the main causes which uh, related to the drugs, uh, either corticosteroids, either systematic or topical corticosteroids, and uh, most important one is the systematic 
with long-term therapy, uh, it has a, a, a very bad consequences on the wound healing and the tensile strength of the wounds, and also increasing the wound healing complications. Topical corticosteroids also have uh, negative effects, including dermal atrophy, pigmentation, and uh, extirpation of the skin infections. Uh, another drug uh, most commonly used in older ages as well, warfarin and other anticoagulant, uh, uh, and which usually accompanied by within three to five days by uh, of initiation uh, of warfarin, in presence of protein C and S deficiency, which will uh, uh, resemble this picture uh, and results in skin tears. Uh, moving forward, we will have like the very important and determining factor for the skin tears in the aging process, which will be accompanied with a lot of comorbidities, uh, mostly decreasing the growth factors, decreasing the epithelialization, androgenic factors, uh, androgenic activity, uh, uh, other associated with having a lot of medications, decreasing the mobility and decreasing, uh, increasing the susceptibility to falls. Uh, this will lead to decrease the percentage of closed wounds and elderly uh, as compared to younger population. And to just like go in depth a little bit and see how much the physical uh, changes which will happen in the uh, epidermal and the dermal layers of the skin or the skin in general, uh, uh, over time with the progression of the age, you will, uh, you will see that the uh, epidermal thickness and the dermal thickness will be less. And also the changes in the melanocyte distribution and number, decreasing the global lipid content and increasing the trans epidermal water loss. Uh, also flattening of the dermo-epidermal junction, which we will be discussing in details in the upcoming slides. Uh, uh, also this accompanied by decreasing, decreasing the dermis uh, vascularity and uh, the decreasing uh, of extracellular matrix uh, component. Uh, of course, with decreasing the subcutaneous fat. Here, as you can see in this like, you know, graph, uh, over time, starting at the age of 30, the extracellular matrix, especially the collagen and the elastin started to drop over time. And uh, this is also associated with the, uh, or correlated with the estrogen levels, as you can see here, uh, which will be decreasing over time. And that's why we will spot the light at the end of uh, my slides on the estrogen uh, uh, positive effect on the uh, healing of the wounds and the, the quality of the, of the skin as well as a hormonal therapy. So this is like interesting study that showed the difference between the young and the edge of the skin, which was done ex vivo, where the group uh, of the researchers studied the uh, load pressure on the skin that was harvested uh, from the abdominoplasties, uh, abdominoplasty surgeries. Uh, from like young female patients versus uh, old female patients. And this was actually uh, went through uh, uh, load pressure and then they uh, harvested the tissue and did that they uh, uh, assess the immunohistological character of these uh, tissues after the pressure load uh, after like half an hour, one hour, two hours and four hours. Interestingly, uh, they found with the uh, uh, edge of the skin, the, the pressure was like, you know, affecting the skin and the shearing move, uh, uh, effect of the pressure was prominent at two hours. As you can see here from the uh, zoomed image, that there is separation between the epidermal layer and the dermal component. And this is actually was delayed a little bit in the younger population. As you can see here, uh, it started to occur at four hours interval. Also, there is a, a very important aspect where nowadays we have like the stem cell uh, contribution to the uh, quality and the regenerative capacity of the skin. Uh, uh, with the younger skin, uh, mostly there is a stable epigenome with the abundance of creatinocyte stem cells and uh, uh, the dermal, uh, uh, dermal mesenchymal stem cells that uh, with associated dermal papillary 
uh, as you can see here, dermal papillary uh, microvessels will nourish the skin and uh, make the skin, if there is injuries or, or uh, 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 any plant trauma or any shearing forces, this is would be rapidly renewing and restor restoring the, the, the regenerative capacity of the skin, which will be decreasing over time uh, as you can see here with the chronological aging, you can see unstable epigenome, ultraviolet rays exposure, decreasing the keratinocyte stem, uh, stem cells with the depletion of the dermal mesenchymal stem cells uh, uh, prone. All those factors and uh, changes will uh, uh, predispose this skin to infection and the new plasmas. And because we know that the uh, the skin is the largest organ of the body and it is the uh, first gate uh, for the barrier function and the first line of the defense uh, from the external environment. And actually the epidermis uh, playing a major role in this and we will start to discuss this in details in the upcoming slides. Most importantly, the keratinocytes and the tight junctional proteins uh, playing a major role for protecting the skin and the body from invasion by uh, uh, external factors such as allergen and uh, the infection and internally protecting the skin from uh, uh, or the body from uh, loss of the water and then uh, which will result in the later stages uh, with chronological aging uh, for drying, dryness of the skin and also the fragility and what we see uh, in most of uh, those cases. As you can see here, uh, uh, with the chronological aging, you can see dry, brittle, and scaly epidermis, which will be uh, losing the tongue junctional proteins, which will allow the water to evaporate between the uh, uh, in between the cells, and this is will decrease uh, the uh, uh, water content in the keratinocytes, which will be uh, increasing uh, the vulnerability of the skin uh, to be invaded by external factors as well, such as uh, allergens or uh, any uh, virals or bacterial infect bacterial infections. Uh, the other, the other uh, major thing in the tight junctional proteins, which we'll be explaining, uh, this is as a, a which will uh, act as a glue, which is like you know uh, between the cells, and I will be explaining this in the next slide, as you can see here with the, this micro ultra structure uh, microscopy of the tight junctional proteins, which we call it. Uh, between the, the keratinocytes and the epidermis in the epidermal layer. Uh, they are different proteins, actually, clodines, occludines, and uh, 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 others. Uh, so here you can see this uh, uh, this mesomal junction or tug junction proteins by ultrasound uh, by uh, uh, electron microscopy. And here, this is like the alter structure of this dysmosome. This is only one dysmosome or tongue junction protein between the two cells. In the bottom, uh, in the bottom image, you can see uh, one line separation between the two cells, which is connecting actually the two cells. And when they, uh, in, in this study, uh, started to uh, uh, inject the dye or put the erythinum red uh, added on the top of the surface of the two cells, uh, it didn't go through uh, between the two cells because uh, intact tight junction proteins, where do you see the back uh, the black arrow is pointing where the dye is still in the surface and they didn't go in the depth, meaning that this is intact junctional proteins. Uh, also, a very important uh, like barrier factor or imp uh, important. Uh, uh, like defense factor, uh, which is like forming a major component of the epidermis, uh, which is uh, uh, ceramides or the lipid, lipid layer. Ceramides are natural lipid components of the skin that help from uh, a barrier to help the skin retain moisture. Uh, also, uh, the ceramides, as you can see here from the top image on the left-hand side, uh, you can see that the keratinocytes itself is embedded in this lipid layer. So it is like uh, some sort of bricks and mortar uh, uh, shape. 
And this, uh, in the bottom image, you can see how the distribution of this ceramides and the lipid layer between the keratinocytes. And over the, like, you know, over the years, this ceramides and the lipid component will decrease and will, uh, uh, like, predispose the skin to uh, more dehydration and also less protection from the invasion by external environmental factors. As you can see here from the right side graph, you can see the healthy skin with intact uh, 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 skin barrier and also uh, a lot or abundance of the lipid layer or ceramides. Uh, with the uh, drying of the skin, you will see here that the lipid layer started to decrease and also started the breaching of the skin barrier uh, function. With the damaged skin, this is, will be more uh, like prominent and with uh, also skin disease, as you can see in the last bar in the graph on the right side. So to go for like, you know, in depth for how, how the corneocytes or the keratinocytes are connected together. There is a, a very important structure, which called the dysmosome, which is connecting the uh, uh, plasma membrane and the intermediate filaments, which extending from the cytoplasm for each corneocytes to the uh, other cell and making a tight junctional, uh, which will prevent and protect the skin from the shearing forces, which will be applied. And this dysmosomes is like, present in like mucous membranes and also the most of the epithelium uh, and but uh, uh, its effect is uh, more prominent in the skin layer uh, as it extending between the uh, the corneocytes uh, preventing their separation from the shearing forces which will be applied uh, in normal daily activities or any plant trauma or anything like that with the ages this is also will be affected uh, uh, structurally as I will explain here, in some of those diseases, uh, uh, if there is like, you know, uh, inherent deficiency of uh, placophyllin one, uh, which will be uh, leading to fragile skin syndrome. This is the structure, microstructure, I, uh, cartonic representation of the structure of the dermosome. You can imagine this is like, you know, the uh, green outline, this is a cell and the other side is uh, another cell with the nucleus as it is indicated by blue color. With the, this filament is the intermediate filaments. And to connect this cell with the other cell, there is there are like multiple components over there. And that's what we call it the dysmosomal uh, uh, junction or the dysmosome structure. So uh, uh, in between the two cells outside the cells, there will be two uh, structure which you call dysmocolin and dysmoglein which are mostly coherent. And uh, this will be connected uh, to the intermediate filaments uh, by another uh, proteins, which are called placophyllin and placoglobin. Uh, and these two will be connected with the intermediate filament by the desmoplakin. So you think about this external between the cellular connection, which is like the cadrins and tight junction proteins, uh, connecting the intermediate filament, which is like, you know, uh, very strong filaments from the inside the cells itself by intermediate adapters, which is like the placoglobin and the placophyllins. With the deficiency of the placophyllin uh, in this syndrome, uh, will decreasing the stabilization of this uh, uh, dysmosomal components, uh, which will result uh, and skin fragility syndrome characterized by trauma induced blisters and erosions and more common in animals. And as you can see here also there is uh, there are there, uh, there are others structurally changes of uh, the histological layers, especially the epidermis. Uh, mostly we will call it retiridges and which is the epithelial extensions if you see here from the epidermal, uh, on the left side image uh, in the useful normal scan, you can see some extension of the epidermis or the epithelial layers in the dermis, which we call it reti ridges. This is a very prominent uh, like structure uh, in the young age or the healthy skin. With the, uh, while we are uh, aging, 
this like will be flattening and also will uh, decrease the skin uh, epidermal thickness and uh, prone this uh, skin to uh, easily traumatized uh, uh, to be easily traumatized and also invasion by different like external factors this is like i'm coming back to uh, like you know to the estrogen effect on the uh, in the skin wrinkling and the aging as i i mentioned in the early slides uh, the estrogen plays a, a pretty important role, and this is, was like evident uh, when they uh, started to uh, give the estrogen uh, uh, as a hormonal replacement therapy. Uh, it was actually studied in human as well as in, in, in uh, experimental animal studies, uh, and it was proven uh, that the, with the over uh, overectomized rodents showed uh, less. Uh, uh, decreasing or decreasing the uh, the wound healing over time, and when they were replaced by estrogen, uh, they regained the normal healing of the wounds. And this is was also studied in in the human, uh, as you can see here. This like was a uh, young uh, patient, female patients. They were like biopsied from the internal arm. Uh, four millimeter uh, biopsy, punch biopsy, and then they were like, you know, uh, reassessed at day seven again, uh, and then at day 84. Uh, uh, actually, there was like prominent effect uh, on the aged subjects, which we found that decreasing the rate of re-epithelialization and decrease of wound healing in those patients compared to young patients. And with the patient who were like, you know, provided the hormonal replace, uh, replacement therapy as estrogen or combined uh, for three months, we found that they regained the uh, regenerative capacity of the, of, the, uh, of the skin and improved the skin heal, uh, wound healing and re uh, Not only uh, the re but also improved the collagen uh, deposition uh, in those uh, wounds. And uh, from the other aspect, they discovered that the increasing the level of the uh, TGF beta one a day uh, seven post wounding. And from all this observation, they uh, came to the conclusion that the hormonal, hormonal replacement therapy is important, but it has to be taken with cautious because of the systemic side effects and other uh, serious uh, effects on the different body of the uh, body parts uh, and the side effects as well. Uh, uh, here, this is just like a summary of whatever the the uh, effect or positive uh, effect of the estrogen uh, action in skin and postmenopausal uh, women. Uh, and as I explained, it improved the reepsilization, improve, uh, increasing the level of uh, TGF beta one, and also increasing uh, the MMP, uh, decreasing the MMPs, and also uh, improving the collagen or extracellular matrix deposition. Uh, overall, improving the uh, the healing of the wounds in those patients. Uh, also, there are a lot of comorbidities associated with the aging and also uh, with other diseases such as diabetes, uh, which will be uh, accompanied by macro and microvascular complications, motor sensory and autonomic neuropathy, uh, also tissue alteration due to advanced glycation and in the products. Uh, uh, other factors as well, like renal insufficiency, which will alter the vitamin D metabolism. Uh, chronic inflammatory state, decreasing uh, the granulation uh, in the, during the wound healing, uh, chronic uh, hyponatremia, which will be decreasing the, uh, the uh, uh, energy stores and also the protein stores. I will explain this in the, in the last slide. Uh, also decreasing the fibroblast proliferation and the collagen synthesis. Here, uh, this is just like a brief uh, slide on the rule of nutrition and uh, this is like a very extensive uh, uh, topic uh, about the rule uh, of the nutrition for the normal skin quality and uh, the normal uh, uh, wound healing as well but here i will just like uh, i need to show you what is the imbalance or unbalanced uh, wound healing if there is like malnutrition uh, uh, if there is like 
uh, uh, macronutrients deficiency, which will decrease the energy stores, which will be uh, increasing the catabolism uh, during the wound healing process, uh, and also decreasing the protein content uh, and decreasing the protein, uh, increasing the protein synthesis uh, will decrease uh, the anabolism, and all of those will be contributing to the non-healing wounds and the stalling wounds. Uh, if you are providing those patients with macronutrients and supplementary uh, uh, vitamins and other uh, trace elements, uh, there will be replenishment, replenishing the energy stores and increasing the protein stores as well, uh, 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 regaining the balance between the anabolism and the catabolism and improving the wound healing. Interestingly, there was like, you know, documentation of one of the studies that uh, at the level of like 10% loss of uh, uh, the energy stores uh, from the body, uh, the body uh, will prioritize the wound healing. But after this uh, 10% and up to 20%, there will be uh, also balance from the body that he will be, uh, that the body will be prioritizing the wound healing uh, as well as regaining the, prote uh, the protein stores. But after the 20% loss of uh, lean body mass, uh, mostly at uh, 30%, uh, the body will be uh, start to prioritize restoration of uh, uh, like, you know, the energy stores and other uh, protein stores, uh, which will be depleted already uh, because the fat will be consumed and other sources, which is uh, uh, readily available. And now it will go to uh, the muscle uh, consumption and also the uh, the bone, which will be affecting the uh, uh, the bone and the muscles, uh, leading to myopathies, uh, brittle bones, and also uh, uh, stalling of the wound healing over there. This is uh, will be just like spotting the light how important uh, that we have to provide and assist the patient. Uh, while uh, we are managing the wound itself to uh, support the nutritional needs of the patient. And this is, I think, will be also discussed in the clinical uh, part of this webinar. Uh, the nutrition itself, uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, the malnutrition, uh, most of the patients will be above the 65 uh, 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 years old, uh, which will uh, result in altered metabolism, uh, also, they are associated with the decreased appetite, uh, uh, and all of those patients always having uh, a lot of medication, that they will be having a lot of uh, GIT upsets uh, with other comorbidities and the chronic diseases, which will be uh, 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 contributing to the malnutrition of those patients. Uh, one, one important tool, which I wanted to make sure that... Uh, uh, I'm just getting your uh, your attention to is like assessment and the screening of those patient is very important and uh, there is a a, a very uh, good tool valuable tool which called uh, malnutrition universal universal screening tool and this chart on the right side you can, uh, there are multiple steps uh, from step one to step five I wouldn't go in details uh, for this one but this is valuable tool. Uh, to uh, use while you are assessing the malnutrition uh, for all of those uh, patients. Uh, of course, management of, of those like, you know, scenarios and the malnutrition, it has to be uh, taken uh, carefully and seriously uh, by enteral supplementation, protein shakes, multivitamins, and iron supplementation as needed. Uh, I think by this slide, uh, I'm done with my uh, first part, and uh, I'm, uh, uh, let's move to the next part, uh, which would be the more interesting part uh, with the clinical cases, and Dr. Laura. All right, thank you so much. Um, move on to the next slide. So looking at skin tears, the prevalence really varies across settings. It can vary all the way from 3% up to 41%. So looking at, you know, is this occurring in the home? Is this occurring um, in the long-term care setting, in the NICUs? Um, looking at who's at risk and where they're staying. Go to the next slide. So 
So the common causes, and I really like that slide in the beginning of the presentation that he presented, was the car door. I feel like so many patients come in and that's what everybody says is what gave them the skin tear was getting, you know, the car door or they're not sure what they think it was the car door. But blunt trauma is certainly very common. I mean, these are all um, common causes identified through research that, you know, I can confirm um, that I see in, in clinical practice, absolutely. Dressing removal, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Performing activities of daily living. So another really common uh, thing that I hear is that people were, uh, yeah, donning their compression stockings. So, um, and then falls is another really common cause. That's okay, you can go to the next slide. So looking at MARSI, medical adhesive related skin injury, that is the term um, MARSI. So this is something where it's, um, you know, quite a common occurrence. Um, and we look to prevent it by preparing the skin properly. So maybe using a skin barrier before placing a dressing. Um, deciding what kind of dressing we are going to be using. You can see um, that's actually my arm there, though, de demonstrating a removal technique and a, a proper dressing to use to help prevent Marcy. So that is a silicone bordered foam dressing, which is very gentle on the peri wound skin, helping to prevent Marcy. And then also that arrow showing this is the direction that you need to start pulling the dressing off so that you aren't disturbing any skin flap. Um, and then the removal technique is also very important. Looking at the angle of the dressing that you're pulling off, you know, you don't just want to rip the dressing right off. Um, and they've studied this very closely, actually, in burn patients, especially, but um, you need to remove it, you know, peel and push. So, so at a low angle, you know, lift the dressing a little bit and then push down on the skin and peel and push and peel and push and slowly remove that dressing um, so to decrease the shear forces and hopefully prevent Marcy. I'm going to the next slide. Looking at our at-risk population, so how we're talking about the variants and settings, but certainly our very young are also at increased risk of this. A lot of the, the skin changes that we see in the very old who are we know are at risk and we also see in the very young. Critically and chronically ill populations tend to uh, suffer from skin tears and then multiple comorbidities. Go to the next slide. Factors that increase the risk of skin tears in elders. So as we all you know, went through in the, in the beginning there, skin change is associated with aging, but a lot of clinical factors as well. Looking at, and these are again um, identified through research um, as, as factors that will increase the risk. The dependence on others for care. So we're looking at you know, other people applying compression stockings, grabbing onto their arms when they're transferring them in the home, that type of a thing will lead to skin tears. The presence of edema. So we know that that's thinning the skin, um, it's decreasing the oxygenation there, and people are gonna have complications from that. Higher concurrent risk of pressure injury development in these populations, and those were really great images earlier on uh, the loading risk, the, the pressure response in young versus uh, aged skin. Cognitive impairment, so you're more likely to have a dependence on others for care if you have a cognitive impairment. Uh, you're certainly at increased risk for falls. And then aggressive behavior, so people may be uh, stabilizing that patient for their safety or the patient's safety, and that can uh, cause falls. It can also contribute to skin tears. So go to the next slide. And that's where we get into modifiable risk factors. So there are a lot of things, you know, certainly aging in general, at least in this point, uh, we aren't able to reverse that as a modifiable risk factor, but looking at just xerosis, so moisturizing the skin, having a good skincare regimen in place, whether that be in the home or a facility that they're cleansing with a good balanced cleanser and then moisturizing um, right after that every day. Looking at our fall prevention program, is there um, anything that can be changed in terms of devices maybe that may be contributing to skin tears? 
handling during care and making sure that people are cognizant of where they're placing their arms when assisting with transfers, that type of a thing. The use of adhesives, like we talked about Marcy, limiting the use of adhesives um, to the minimum amount necessary to keep a dressing in place or a medical device in place, and then preparing the skin properly and choosing the right kind of adhesive for the patient's skin. Our nutritional intake, like we talked about, uh, polypharmacy is huge, and I think that just goes along with aging and that we know as we age, we tend to accumulate uh, more and more pharmaceuticals that we're taking and like we talked about before, behavioral issues. So certainly a modifiable risk factor to some degree that hopefully we could decrease aggressive or agitated behaviors in the patient you know, using their arms and being at risk for skin tears due to that. So skin tears are acute wounds, but uh, because of the populations that tend to experience them, I, I tend to think of them as complex wounds um, prior to that exaggerated healing timeline. We'll go to the next slide. So I kind of conceptualize that for myself uh, in terms of the aging and thinking about even though it's an acute wound, it's already a complex wound, even though it hasn't been around for that, you know, four weeks or, or however you like to think about a chronic wound. And that's because as we age, we have these biophysical changes that uh, you went through in the beginning of the presentation. We're taking more pharmaceuticals. We accumulate psychosocial and social determinant of health issues, and we have all of these comorbid disease states, and kind of all of that wraps together and, and makes you more likely to have complications. So as we age, we have increased conditions associated with the development of wounds and then delayed wound healing, as we're familiar with. Now, when we're looking for skin findings that are associated with skin tears, things we tend to see commonly with these patients, hematomas, we went through that uh, warfarin skin necrosis, but certainly um, hematomas in general. Again, Cardor uh, is a common culprit there. Senile purpuras, uh, so I think there's a better term for that now. Um, Patients always don't like it when I say, oh, that, you know, what are these? I have all these bruises. Well, those are, you know, not really bruises. There's something called senile purpura. And like, ah, geez. Um, so commonly seen in skin tears, photo aging. We can see those um, spots there with uh, aging skin. And then if you had a previous skin tear, you're more at risk for another skin tear and ecchymosis. So when we see bruising and ecchymosis on the skin, um, we're knowing that there's probably some behaviors and uh, disease states that will contribute to your risk of skin tears. You can go to the next slide. So getting back to what do you do when you see a patient with a skin tear, going back to that ISTAP decision algorithm, obviously we wanna control the bleeding and then clean it really well. And then just, you know, after you reapproximate that skin flap, if there is a skin flap or to what degree you can reapproximate it, we get back to just really good evidence-based wound care, undisturbed wound healing, moist wound healing. We want to cover it, protect it from trauma and leave it undisturbed. You can go to the next slide. Well, so treating the cause, implementing prevention protocols, all of that. Um, but one RTC found faster healing with silicone foam over non-adherent dressings. So I always say they're not non-adherent dressings. They're not, <laughs> they adhere and they don't manage moisture and that inflammatory drainage. So this is a no brainer for me, but it's good to have the evidence backing that up that, you know, placing a silicone foam dressing that, you know, you can leave in place up to a week um, and leave that undisturbed has been found to, to have better healing with these patients. You can go to the next slide. So we approximate the flap, we leave it undisturbed so that the edges can reattach. We can get that cerebral shape, the epithelial edge advancement for healing. Can go to the next slide. The healing of approximated flaps, when you do place that skin flap back in place, you don't want to use sutures, staples, adhesive strips, anything like that um, to keep that flap in place. A lot of times people come in and they just have this spider web of, uh, of adhesive strips on there. And 
we know that that surrounding skin is too fragile. That's why the patient has a skin tear is because they have fragile skin. So now we have these uh, really strong adhesives that, that can contribute to Marcy that can cause more skin stripping. So we want to avoid that and use the dressing as the stabilization to approximate that flap. You can go to the next slide. So now uh, briefly, I just have a couple cases to go through demonstrating a lot of the factors that we've talked about. The first one, this is an 81 year old female. This is her right lateral calf. Uh, she has a complicated or a moderately complicated past medical history of end stage renal disease due to a hereditary polycystic kidney and liver disease. And due to that, she had a renal transplant. Um, and so she's immunocompromised from um, her pharmaceutical intake for that renal transplant and then develop type 2 diabetes amassed by the steroids uh, that are making her immunocompromised that were taken for the kidney transplant, uh, CHF, AFib, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, they have a pacemaker, they have gout, they have a history of skin cancer, so a lot of comorbidities. And when you take a look at that peri wound skin, you can see how a lot of those comorbidities and age and steroid intake um, have, a, have affected the quality of the skin leading to the skin tear. Um, so with this patient, we can see a pretty large wound there that presented at 45.5 square centimeters total. Um, and this is an ISTAP type 3 because we have no skin flap. But what actually happened is uh, after the skin tear, it was approximated, the skin flap. However, during the dressing change, the husband removed the dressing the wrong direction. So again, why we place that arrow is to hopefully avoid something like this, where removing it in the opposite direction just ripped the entire skin flap um, right off. So an ISTAP type three. Now looking at the pharmaceuticals that she takes, she's taking, you know, certainly polypharmacy, right? A lot of them are necessary given the comorbidities. However, I've highlighted the ones where, you know, we know that um, this could impact wound healing. We have vertacrolemus, making her immunocompromised, prednisone, and how clearly we know that chronic, uh, chronic intake can impact wound healing and skin health in general, leading to the skin tear, and then um, anticoagulants as well. We'll go to the next slide. So, um, and this 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 photo was on our our slide demonstrating what the skin of patients that suffer from skin tears tends to look like because we can see a lot of those uh, skin characteristics in this patient. The senile purpura, the skin atrophy, that wrinkling, dry skin. They have a full separation of the dermis and the epidermis, um, and com again, complete flap loss here. You can go to the next slide. Um, because this is a complex patient, so this patient, it's an acute wound, it's a skin tear, but they have, uh, they're immunosuppressed, they have type two diabetes and a number of other comorbidities. Um, so I, I look to, you know, aggressive management to get this to heal as quickly as possible. So we did soap and water cleansing followed by a hypochlorous acid. Uh, non-contact low frequency ultrasound. So the patient actually was being seen in the in the center for another wound that they were receiving that therapy for. So we were able to provide that um, to this wound as well. And then we used a next generation silver dressing. That's a dressing that has silver as well as EDTA and benzothonium chloride um, to help address biofilm. And that's to absorb more drainage and to help leave the dressing in place longer because it is a larger wound. And we followed that up with that silicone bordered foam dressing to just leave this undisturbed in between clinic visits and just let, let the body do its thing. So next slide. And this is what we looked like at the three week follow up. So just about epithelialized, we have a little pinpoint openings in the center there with some drainage remaining, but in that 45 square centimeter wound, we're down to one square centimeter at three week follow up. So given our comorbidities and, and everything, a really positive outcome for this patient. Can go to the next slide. Um, so here again, we just have presentation, full flap loss, and then at three week follow up, you know, nearly epithelialized. So looking really well there. Can go to the next slide. 
And uh, just real quick here at the end, my last case, skin tears to both arms. So this is what we see all the time, what people see in long-term care facilities and nursing facilities, um, you know, acute care across the board, what we're seeing. So skin tears, a 90-year-old female. This is from the door, not a car door, but the door from her assisted living facility. And they have a, a complex medical history as well, a lot of autoimmune conditions. We have Raynaud's, uh, Sjogren's, coronary artery disease. So, you know, if you have it in your in your heart, you have it in your arms and your legs too, right? So probably some peripheral arterial disease as well. Adrenal insufficiency with chronic steroid use again. Uh, recurrent foot ulcers, that's why they're being seen in the clinic, lymphoma, Crohn's, autoimmune hepatitis, and then calcific arteriolopathy. And um, that actually was treated in the clinic and developed from a skin tear. That's not, not from these skin tears here, but just a little uh, interesting anecdote. So um, looking at these, you know, they present with these just from the door. We clean them with soap and water, hypochlorous acid, and then put that silicone bordered foam in place and just leave that for an entire week. And then she was able to epithelialize, you know, in that week time frame. So just providing some really good care, approximating as much of the flap as possible uh, and leaving it undisturbed to, to heal on its own. You can go to the next slide. So I'll pass it back to um, Mohammed. Thank you so much, Laura, for uh, your presentation. Wonderful uh, and the clinical demonstration as well. So I think we just like uh, wanted to summarize uh, the peers from today's webinar or take home message. So we should take the patient as a like one uh, part, not like, you know, we are addressing the wound healing and the missing other parts like nutrition and the other factors that are affecting the skin itself. So we will be uh, having like to correct the uh, general condition of the patients, uh, uh, assessment of the nutrition, taking care, supplement the, supplement, uh, supplementing the, the patient with the uh, uh, their needs uh, from the deficiency, like, you know, uh, vitamins, uh, traces, proteins, and others. Uh, very important moisturization and the skin barrier function. This is very important factor as well. Uh, work up for autoimmune disorders. Don't forget this, like, you know, factor and manage the real problem. And uh, of course, undisturbed wound healing, as Laura was like emphasizing on this, like, part, especially with the adhesives. Uh, this is like very important factor to uh, to take care uh, of it. Uh, by this, I think uh, that's the end of our slides, and we will be uh, happy to take any questions. And back to Lisa, uh, if there is are if there are any questions. Thank you. Hi, you guys did a wonderful job there. You covered it very well. There aren't too many questions. I I had one. Uh, in terms of vitamin A supplementation in your particular oral corticosteroid patients, do you have a specific recommendation or do you recommend that? So most patients are taking a multivitamin, so I don't supplement uh, vitamin A uh, on top of that. I typically recommend a multivitamin, vitamin D, and then, you know, protein. Okay. We used to, I worked at an... Um, a burn center we did a lot of higher dose 10,000 units yeah. short courses like there but I could never find anything some did it 10 days some did it 30 days sometimes I see a difference um what about the arginines and the oral collagen supplementation that's a big question I get I get that question all the time I feel like we could have a whole session just right. on protein and collagen so I I don't think the evidence is there to be recommending taking collagen. Certainly, I mean, there is some with arginine, I think, and pressure injury risk um, in terms of, of elasticity and, and moisture and things like that. But for wound healing, I would consider collagen as like a protein. Like if you're taking a collagen supplement, great, because you're getting more general protein intake, but I can't necessarily recommend that you take specifically collagen at this time. Right. That's quite, I have patients that spend a lot of money on those things too, and I have yet mm -hmm. to find any evidence. So thank you so mm -hmm. much.
I think that might be all our questions. Great. Well, thank you, everybody, and thank you for attending the Chronicles of Wound Scene Investigation Series brought to you by the Wounding Society Education Committee and Wound Healing You. And as a reminder, the recording will be available in your members-only account on the Wound Healing You in the next few weeks. And our next webinar will be on October 10th on MRSA, abscess, and bacterial toxigenesis at 6 p.m. Eastern. Another enthralling subject with lots of lots of uh, information to impart. So thank you, everybody, um, and have a good evening. And...